Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, to the 49th Annual Toe Research Awards to the Nurse Midwife Allied Health Division. My name's Marilyn Cruikshank, and I'm the Professor of Nursing for the Sydney Children's Hospital Network. Um, before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation who have cared for the land and waters uh, on which we meet today. I acknowledge their continuing presence, uh, their elders past and present, and any who may be here today. We have three speakers this afternoon uh, in this session. The first is Dr. Daniel Tracy from the Physiotherapy Department of Prince of Wales Hospital. He's going to be speaking on mobility training outcomes for older adults with frailty that are not enhanced by strength training or specialized equipment and exploration of a systematic review and meta-analysis. Thank you, Daniel. Do I, yes. Sorry, do I use a mic or just not no, just speaking? Frailty is a common syndrome in, in older people characterized by a decline across multiple body systems, causing decreased reserve and increased vulnerability to an adverse health outcomes. Frailty has been identified as emerging global health risk, particularly for the older populations. Uh, frailty is independently predictive of falls, falls-related fractures, uh, worsening mobility, deteriorating functioning, impaired activity of daily living, hospitalisation, institutionalisation and death. Frailty is therefore costly to the individual, family and society in itself. And the percentage of people becoming frail is increasing. It's estimated that 21% of Australian community dwelling population over 65 years or older are frail, with a 30 with a further 48% being pre-frail. Now, high rates of mobility and functional decline are evident in a frail community dwelling population with decreased mobility levels and function levels, often leading to things like hospital admission or moving to an aged care facility. In fact, more than 50% of people admitted to an inpatient rehabilitation unit in Australia for reconditioning are frail. So reducing the mobility and functional decline uh, should be a key goal of intervention for frail older people with interventions at slow mobility and functional decline in this frail population impacting upon morbidity and also mortality. Um, the ICF uh, guidelines um, have recommended uh, that there are um, two particular uh, physical activity focuses for intervention. One is that older people with frailty should be offered a multi-component exercise program. And the second is that individuals should also be offered uh, programs with a, a res physical resistance training program. What they also do know is that there's actually no evidence to determine which, which type of exercise is most effective, whether this be strength, resistance, balance, or a combination of aerobic and other exercises. So despite the overwhelming balance, overwhelming evidence of our physical activity for frail older people, frail individuals don't tend to exercise. And so factors such as the time taken to travel to the exercise setting, uh, the costs of exercising have all been identified as factors that reduce someone's compliance. Um, Henry Adele found that prescribing a lower number of exercises um, within a home exercise environment program resulted in increased uh, compliance, adherence with compliance of the exercise. So this really focuses on the importance of the therapist to really tailor the exercise program to the individual needs of the patient. So tailoring of the exercise program re requires careful consideration of both the risks and benefits of each type of exercise as well as the current health status and function. So if one type of exercise addresses multiple conditions, it's really preferable to one that is more limited. So this systematic review done by Sherrington et al. in 2020 found strong evidence that balance and functional exercises are effective for reducing falls. 
Now, balance and functional exercises are a key component of mobility training. They also identified that resistance training by itself wasn't effective for reducing falls. Similarly, this systematic review looking at the effect of exercise for improving balance, once again found that gait, balance and coordination exercises were effective for improving balance. Well, once again, not seeing that same effect for uh, exercises that purely controlled strength exercises. Now, despite this increasing amount of evidence showing um, that uh, despite the overwhelming evidence showing uh, that that frail that mobility training is increasing is a really effective mobility a really effective strategy for frail individuals, um, strength and resistance training is increasingly being seen as the be all and end all of uh, exercise interventions for frail individuals. In fact, the ACI recently spent uh, multiple time and resources developing uh, big developing videos on teaching uh, people how to do. Uh, using exercise, using big equipment, after big expensive equipment, after big more expensive equipment, and more expensive equipment. And in fact, many studies have used exercise programs that use these specialised large or costly pieces of equipment that really can't be accessible to individuals in their home or environment and really do need to go to places like gyms for them to participate. So the question we wanted to, so we wanted to know two questions to two answers. Firstly, does strength training in addition to mobility training provide benefit over mobility training alone? And secondly, do programs that involve specialised equipment provide benefit over programs that do not use specialised equipment? And both of these were looking at improving mobility in far older individuals living in the community. And so to do this, we analyzed the results of a systematic review we previously completed, which had searched the seven databases are noted there. So our inclusion criteria was people aged 65 years or older living in the community who were frail. Now to be included in the study, really the study had to justify why the individual was frail. So we didn't accept where our study might have said they were frail without any actual measure to determine that. Um, the intervention needs to target improvement in mobility, and we define mobility according to the ICF definition of changing um, and maintaining a body position, walking and moving. And so the training also needs to involve a performance of a task um, that had a monitored component with a review of the participants' performance during the delivery. And we included trials where the intervention group was compared to a control group that receives no intervention, usual care, sham exercise, or a social visit. So initially we found, when we did the review, we found uh, 1,300 and a bit over 13,000, sorry, uh, records, um, which when we removed duplicates, it re uh, reduced to just over 12,000. Um, from reviewing abstracts and the titles, we were able to initially reduce that down to a total of 267 articles, um, which we needed to review completely to determine the eligibility. And from that 267, we identified 12 studies. Um, interestingly, one of the major reasons for studies being excluded was although they called the participants frail, there's actually was never um, any justification or any outcome measure to uh, determine that. So when we looked at results comparing the use of specialised equipment versus non-specialised equipment, we found that four studies um, used specialised equipment with eight not using it. Now, analysis of the trials show that there was a non-statistically significant benefit in mobility levels for trials that did not include specialised equipment, which is really promising. And also really excitingly is a clinical difference, is the, is the difference that we do see for the non-specialised equipment when we transformed it back to a, um, an outcome measure actually resulted in a clinically significant difference. Now, three of the study, when we looked at strength, um, including the strength, so three of the studies had strength as a primary exercise intervention, um, and while nine had it as a secondary or no, uh, or no involvement. And when we looked at analysis of the trials, we showed that there's really little or no difference in the effect of mobility levels for trials that had strength as primary versus strengths that had no strength or secondary. 
We then similarly looked at programs that had um, any strength, so as either as secondary or primary, versus programs that had no strength at all. And once again, we actually found really similar results with little to no difference in the effect on mobility levels. So what this helps us to indicate is that we don't really see any significant difference in outcomes for studies that added our strength training towards the mobility training of the program. So the results of this meta-analysis show that mobility training outcomes were not um, enhanced by addition of strength training or the use of specialised equipment in a frail community dwelling population. However, we do acknowledge there were a limited number of studies within this systematic review. Now, now as previous research has highlighted that exercise adherence may decrease with the number of exercises prescribed, um, these results can really be helped to use to prescribe effective exercise programs for individuals uh, with a frail with frailty living in the community. Now, the finding that no additional benefit was gained with programs that use specialised equipment is really important, since factors such as costs and travel time, which are associated with uh, specialised equipment, are really seen as something that decreases physical activity adherence. It therefore should be recommended that physical activity programs for our older people um, should be prescribed with either no equipment or simple equipment and that it is accessible to all individuals and really that the, the type of exercise should really focus on the key goals for the frail individual. I'd just like to finish off by thanking my uh, co-authors for all their support, um, but particularly also the organisers of the TOE Awards for inviting me here today, but also I know all the work that you've been doing over the many years and the work you've done to coordinate today's event. So thank you. Thank you, and right on time, right for the second, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, any questions? Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I know you mentioned adherence as a factor, but I, was, I might have missed it. But was there a difference in adherence between the specialist equipment group and the non-specialist? And is that what actually makes it less effective or is the strength training people less adherent or is that a factor at all? That we yeah, yeah, really good question. I guess when we looked at the analysis of the results of the studies is that those studies are uh, participants have provided free access to the equipment um, when you actually look at the studies themselves um, and then also quite often transports provided. So there's really that, I guess, out of usual care support to allow it. And you're right, so then when you move to that stage where perhaps you then need to actually use this equipment and you've got to find a regime and there's maybe not the therapist support, maybe it's quite expensive and, and you know it's quite loud and it's different to what you normally see, perhaps it really makes sense for these frail older people to, to decrease their adherence once they, they get to that stage, which you're right, could be something that really contributes to that overall outcome. Hey Daniel, great talk. My name is Mike. I'm a pediatric physio. Um, we haven't met. How are you? Uh, my question was about your forest plots. I'd love you to just go back to the ones where they had strength as an intervention as primary or secondary. And um, I think as you were presenting, you explained that it didn't seem to make much of a difference. Can you just maybe explain what the outcomes on that forest plot are and yeah, absolutely. why it shows? Yeah. So I guess if we're looking at the top one, the secondary is, is no strength. Um, we do see that there is a, a, clinic, a, a difference, a statistically significant difference for those exercises that just use that use strength as secondary or no strength. Um, once again, we also see that the primary ones have also have a statistically significant change. But when we actually compare the results, we actually can't be really confident that there is a difference. Although you're right, the, the diamond down the bottom does look further across to the right. When we're actually comparing the two using statistical analysis, there's no statistical significant difference in there as well. Um, and then when we also looked at the result where um, where there was no strength versus a strength, whether some sort of strength, we almost actually saw the exact same diamond plots. So once again, showing both actually had a change, both seemed to result in positive outcomes, but we can't be we can't make the judgment that one is better than the other. And and to me, that's really promising to know that actually just providing a few exercises of one type 
is more effective is just the same as providing you know lots of different exercises because it comes back to a bit around that compliance point and knowing that if you prescribe less participants are less like are more likely to um, do them and we do know if we're getting similar outcomes it's sort of hopefully a no win a no lose situation for us great thanks I Thank you, Daniel. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. Just, just one quick question. Yeah. Oh, so a really good question. And I think it really comes back to uh, this last point is what is the individuals with frailties? What's their main factor and what's their biggest thing? And so I'll give you an example. If it's someone who's falling a lot, well, the evidence shows us that that multi-component and balanced training works but the evidence shows us um, um, resistance training doesn't work. So for that case, it completely makes sense. Well, let's focus on, on the mobility and balance training for that cohort. For some individuals, strength is the true issue that they need to overcome. And so for, that, for those patients, it's really important that we do prescribe resistance and strength exercises. But it's really coming back to this that we should really focus on what the patient's key goals are rather than just assuming that because they're frail, they all need strength training. Individual. Yeah, yep, yep. That's right. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, our second speaker this afternoon is uh, Andrew Grant from the Kids Cancer Research Centre uh, or Can Kids Cancer Centre at Sydney Children's Hospital. And he's speaking this afternoon on Imagine a Pearl, Investigating Models of Care and the Nursing Role in Paediatric Genetic Cancer Risk Clinics. Thank you, Andrew. Let me just... Thank you, Marilyn. Um, and thank you to the organisers of the Toe Research Awards um, for inviting me to speak today. Um, as Marilyn said, I'm a, a clinical nurse specialist working in the Sydney Children's Hospital in the Cancer Genetics Clinic. Um, I'm also a PhD student um, through the University of Technology, Sydney, and I'm going to be talking about my research project, Imagine a Pearl. Before I really get going, I want you to stop and close your eyes and think about what does exceptional health care mean to you? As a healthcare provider, what's it like to deliver exceptional healthcare? Or as a patient or a family member of a patient, what's it like to receive exceptional healthcare? Now, this is what we're hoping to achieve for children and adolescents that have a cancer predisposition syndrome. You can open your eyes. So cancer predisposition syndromes are a genetic change in somebody's DNA that makes them more likely to develop cancer. So um, these genetic change, um, some of these changes can increase a child's risk of developing cancers or tumours. And paediatric cancer um, genetics clinics provide care to children and adolescents with a cancer predisposition syndrome. Really the aim is to identify cancers or tumours as early as possible so it can improve treatment options and improve their long-term outcomes. But this doesn't happen in isolation. There's a, um, we need to think about that child in the context of the holistic care in, um, and with the child in, the, in central in their family. We need to think about um, the other healthcare risks that might be related to these genetic changes. It might not just be the cancer or tumour risk. And we also, these genetic changes can be um, heritable. So we need to think about other family members that might be at risk of other tumours and cancers as well. At the moment, there are a number of challenges that um, exist, and this is partly related to paediatric cancer predisposition syndromes being particularly rare, they're very com complex, and they're relatively new to healthcare. And so there are barriers to care that exist at the moment. Um, for example, you might um, there's um, inequity of access to the care delivery, there's um, barriers related to referral rates, inappropriate referral rates, um, and so there are a lot of challenges that these uh, families um, face. There are gaps in our knowledge of how best to deliver care or what the holistic care needs are for these children and their families. And the other gap is related to what the role of a specialist nurse could be in these clinics. 
nurses have very limited input and, um, and integration into cancer predisposition syndromes and the clinics there, um, but a lot of these gaps and barriers could be addressed by a specialist nurse in this setting. Essentially, a lot of the, um, the care navigation looks to these families like a ninja warrior course. And um, essentially, there could be um, not all children and families are receiving this exceptional care. So the aims of my research are to explore the holistic needs of children and adolescents diagnosed with a cancer predisposition syndrome and identify equitable, efficient and sustainable service strategies. There are three main objectives here. So the first is to describe care needs for children and adolescents with a cancer predisposition syndrome and the needs of their families. The second objective is around designing and piloting a model of care that meets the needs of these families. And the third is to describe a specialist nurse, how a specialist nurse could facilitate exceptional care. So objective one, the needs will help inform what that model of care looks like, as well as inform what the role of the nurse could be. And objective two and three kind of go hand in hand that the model of care will inform the role of the nurse, which will inform the model of care. And there are three research questions directly related to these objectives about what are the care needs, what does that um, model of care look like, and what is the specialist nurse role? So the way that um, I'm going to address these questions um, is through five studies. So study one is looking at a retrospective chart review into two pediatric cancer predisposition syndrome clinics essentially looking at what is happening now um, from the perspective of the healthcare provider and the service. Study two is focusing, um, is, is doing focus groups with clinicians in pediatric cancer predisposition syndrome clinics across Australia, getting an understanding of what the healthcare provider's perspective is, what their needs is and what their experiences are in these clinics. Study three um, is interviews with parents and older adolescents to understand what their needs are and what their experience has been um, through services. Study four is the same, but um, focusing on those younger children and using a guided drawing activity um, to facilitate those interviews. And so you can see in the diagram on the left, objective one will use those first four studies and interpret those findings together to meet the needs um, to, to explore that research question one, what are the needs of these children and the families? Objective two will run in parallel and also use those first four studies um, to answer research question two around those models of care. And both research question one and two will then help inform study five. And this is a focus group with specialist nurses in similar comparable roles. And this will um, help answer research question two, which again will then inform the model of care that's being designed. Now, the two other parts of that is implementation science and the, um, the use of mind maps and process maps or visualization tools um, to help inform the research as well as being informed by the research as well. So implementation science. So if we think about a change or an in intervention um, in healthcare, I think about this as um, a square peg. If we think about the, um, the healthcare system itself, you can think about it as a round hole. Now we can try and hammer that change, that intervention into a healthcare system, but you're likely going to end up either damaging that change itself and meaning that you're not gonna achieve the outcomes or the goals of that intervention, or you're gonna damage the, um, the, inter the healthcare system itself. You're gonna impact the people there, the systems and structures that are already in place. You might damage both or, um, and, and as well, that square peg's probably go going to fall out before too long. It's not gonna be sustainable in a healthcare system. So the way that I think about implementation science is really about making both that change and that healthcare system a little bit more malleable. So that the change is designed in a way that fits into a healthcare system and the healthcare system is supported in a way that it can integrate that change and, and become more malleable and adjusted to, um, to um, rolling it out in a meaningful way. It also helps that healthcare system be more adaptable to, to integrate other changes. So the framework that I'm using is the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Science, and there's five domains related to that um, that we use. So the innovation domain is really exploring that change itself, making sure that model of care and the nursing 
role really fit into the healthcare system in a meaningful way that develops that system appropriately. The outer setting and the inner setting, essentially that system itself. So outer setting is more broad. It could be New South Wales Health or Australia Health um, Services, um, as well as the wider community. The inner setting might be more focused. And so that could be the hospital or the department that's being implemented. Um, and those settings also relate to external healthcare providers. The individuals are the people that need to change. So exploring how they're going to change and what change they need to do to make sure that they can incorporate this in a meaningful way. And this is both the healthcare providers as well as the families and the patients here. Then the implementation process, this is making sure that we can adapt this and adopt it in a meaningful way that is sustainable for the long run, thinking about those four um, previous domains. And then the visualization tools. So the mind mapping and process mapping. These are just two ways to map out in our understanding. And I think of the mind mapping as a bit of a what. So what is going on? It's a snapshot in time of a pediatric cancer genetics clinic. And you can see these eight different nodes that are jumping off that center. There's additional nodes that can build on, um, for example, for education, educating healthcare professionals or patients and their families or internal education. And so it ex it's about exploring that model of care in the nursing role in a meaningful way. The process map is more about the how, how are things being delivered? And this is one process map that um, I've been exploring and it's about the child first getting recognized that maybe there's a change there, integrating them into the clinic, having their genetic testing, having their ongoing medical and genetic follow-up and then transitioning into an adult service. And so combining these are really leveraging each of these mapping tools so that we can explore the complex system in real detail. So we can pull out what are those barriers and what are those facilitators to care and how can we address some of those gaps? Now, um, so um, overall, I'm gonna be using these three objectives, the needs of the children, their families, the model of care, and the, what is the specialist nurse role through those five research um, studies that I mentioned to achieve um, a piloted model of care that meets the needs of the children and their families and a, um, a formal description of what a uh, specialist nurse's role could be, which will help inform policymakers, clinicians and researchers to improve care across the continuum for children and adolescents with a cancer predisposition syndrome, essentially delivering exceptional care for these children and their families. I'd like to acknowledge my supervisors, Marilyn, Jane, Nat and Sharon, and also the clinical team here at the Sydney Children's Hospital Cancer Genetics Clinic. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Questions? Thanks, Andrew. Um, really lovely presentation and so nice to see it come to fruition. I, I guess I just have one uh, comment. I, one, and perhaps I missed it, but I'm wondering is there potential to have the models of care or the input from the parents and families? So looking from a co designed type approach. So as opposed to interviewing the parents and children, actually having them engaged right at the beginning, developing the questions. Yeah, we, I looked at different types of consumer engagement, essentially. And so there's the, you know, consumers particip as participants, children and families participants as part of that. And then not necessarily using a, a, a um, what you'd call a co-design approach, but it's more a, um, a patient and family um, um, co coordination and um Sorry, the word's escaping, but essentially I've engaged two, um, two parents um, from families and getting their perspective really from the um, inception of the research questions. And I'll be engaging them throughout the research to get information and help them tweak different parts of it. Um, and so, for example, tweaking those research questions and getting their perspective on what's really meaningful so that the outcomes meet their needs or helping to adapt and change those interview questions so that it's really targeting what their perspective could be. Lovely, thanks. Thank you for the talk. Um, it's really great to see that implementation science happening. And I was just wanting to ask you what the, once you get your results, how do you take that the next step into practice? 
Yeah, so the implementation process really, so we started the clinic um, that I spoke about about two years ago, um, and really this gives us a great opportunity to, uh, to explore how we're rolling it out to make sure that we're doing it for the long term, um, that it's really meaningful. And there's other centres, I mentioned that we're going to be engaging across Australia, different centres that do this. There are very few of them because they're, they're rare and we have very centralised care that there's few of them. So we'll, we'll engage as many people from across Australia that are delivering this. And so using implementation outcomes, looking about the sustainability, the adoptability and feasibility of implementing these in a meaningful way um, is what we're hoping to achieve. And so we're the I talk about piloting it. Um, this, my research is really about getting a, a model that works um, for the clinicians and works for the families at the Sydney Children's Hospitals Network, but also engaging other clinicians, other, other healthcare services from around Australia, so that once we know how it works, it can then be uh, rolled out at a, at a national level. Thanks for the talk, Andrew. Um, just a quick question. Uh, the number of children with um, uh, like CPS across Australia, uh, what, what's, what would be the number you, you think there is? Um, I don't know. So the, they're, they're, they're quite rare. So in the clinic that we, we see at the moment, um, off the top of my head, I'm probably following up about 50 patients from across New South Wales that have different types of cancer predisposition syndrome. So this is like a collective um, of lots of different types of syndromes and they're individually very rare, but together they're, the more we learn about them, the more we're linking to understand that children that do have cancer, there's about 10% of them that will have a genetic change from our knowledge at the moment that has increased their risk of getting a cancer. And so roughly about you know, 50 or so in New South Wales currently, um, and so across Australia, and, and we're getting more, we're building up our numbers as well. So again, we're relatively new, um, but the more people hear about it and more we understand this and more we're testing for children that have cancer, the more we're identifying. Um, so the numbers are a little bit fluid at the moment. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Our third and final speaker in this session uh, this afternoon is Sarah Grace Paguento, who is an occupational therapist in the occupational therapy department at Sydney Children's Hospital. And her paper this afternoon is on supporting transition to wheelchair use for paediatric neuromuscular conditions. Thank you. So short, I'll go to the side. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you for the privilege of being able to present my research this afternoon, and I'm thankful also to the presenters of the TOE Research Awards for the invitation. Um, and before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge again the Gadigal um, people of the Eunora Nation and the Bidjigal people that we meet on today. Um, it's in particular acknowledging the generations of stories and wisdom that they carry in regards to child and family well-being as well. Um, and I extend my respect to any First Nations people here, um, past, present and emerging. Okay, so for those of you who may not be familiar with this population, um, paediatric neuromuscular diseases um, are often progressive in nature, and many of them end up or, you know, may start with the use of wheelchair equipment. So this may start in early infancy or toddlerhood with the WYSIBUG, like you see on your left, which we started with a 10-month-old, and may progress to more high-end technologies such as the standing power wheelchair on your right. So this is one of my favorite videos. It is a video of a 14 month old spinal muscular atrophy. And this is her first experience of independent mobility. So you can see what a positive and joyful experience it can be for children and families. 
to be able to have their child move and explore independently. Um, but it's not always an easy journey to get here. And in my clinical experience, the recommendation of a wheelchair can be met with sadness and hesitance and can delay implementation. So that's what really inspired my research and my aim is to understand the barriers and facilitators to wheelchair prescription and, rec and engagement. And I did that um, by doing a scoping review and then subsequently qualitative interviews, um, qualitative studies, sorry, with parents and clinicians. And like you can see in the third point, a parent said, it's not just the wheelchair, it's everything else. So what may look like one piece of equipment to us actually has countless ramifications from emotional and log logistical perspective. So as a bit of background, some barriers that were commonly highlighted were the emotional response to wheelchair recommendation, which included grief, loss, denial, and anger. There was also the meaning of walking. So parents perceived wheelchair recommendation um, as abandonment of walking goals. They worried that it would exacerbate their child's disease progression. And they also felt that um, it meant giving up hope on their child's ability to improve or develop. And thirdly, the complexity of the wheelchair prescription process. So there's many steps which involve physical assessment by a therapist, uh, trialing multiple pieces of equipment, funding applications, et cetera, which can take anywhere from a few months to over a year. So on the flip side to that, facilitators included uh, access, well, ready access to information that was reliable and credible, the ability to have shared decision-making um, in wheelchair options, and then finally, the integration of social work and uh, psychology services within neuromuscular clinics um, to really have that ready, ready access. So in thinking of these barriers and facilitators, my next question is how do we meet these needs? And the solution that I developed was a psychoeducational booklet. And this was developed using a process of co-design. As you know, the research says putting the child and family at the center is really how we can maximize outcomes and service delivery for this population. So uh, the final product, the cover you can see there, the booklet in included 11 chapters, which addressed aspects of wheelchair recommendations, including all the domains that you see listed below. So quickly on recruitment, this was a national cross-sectional cohort study. We recruited from all the pediatric clinics in Australia. Parents were recruited um, from Sydney, Melbourne, and Queensland. Clinicians were recruited from here in Sydney. And participants were pr provided a copy of the booklet and completed an online survey. We used mixed methods to analyze the data, included dis including descriptive statistics and analysis of open-ended survey feedback. Overall, we had 27 parents and nine clinicians. Almost all participants were born in Australia with um, over half of parents living in metropolitan areas and the majority of clinicians working in metropolitan areas. So I'll just go into some results now. When we asked parents about their emotional response, the majority of used affirm, sorry, the majority of them affirmed emotions and made them feel understood, hopeful, supported, and not alone. So it was encouraging to us that the booklet didn't cause them any psychological distress. And this is just a snapshot of one of the booklet pages showing how we incorporated quotes to really acknowledge those parent emotions, as well as the written context based on the interviews that we had with families. The next question um, was asking parents what their information and support needs were when their child was first recommended equipment. And you can see the most common responses were those that allowed parents to prepare and to be actively engaged in the wheelchair prescription process. So they included guidance on questions to ask, information about wheelchair related needs, such as school considerations, and information about what wheelchair prescription involves. We then had a follow-up question, which asked if the booklet would have addressed these needs and 100% 100 per 100 of parents said yes. So again, this is another page from the booklet, and here you can see how we've used images and text to inform and help parents prepare for the different parts that we may discuss in regard to their wheelchair needs. The next set of results, we can see that the booklet helped parents' decision-making process by talking, helping them prepare to talk about what matters most to them, organizing their thoughts, informing them about the pros and cons of different wheelchair options, and providing information as to the salient points of why a wheelchair was recommended. 
And here's another page on the booklet that shows where how we highlight the pros and cons of different wheelchair options and why it may or may not be the most beneficial option for their child and family. And just a couple of quotes here. Um, the booklet was acknowledged as, as acknowledged as helping parents to understand the process better and it also helped to normalize feelings and acknowledge the grief process. So just validating that the quantitative and qualitative results really speak to each other. In terms of clinical implications, firstly is integration of the booklet as part of clinical care, which we've already started to do here in Sydney and in the other recruiting hospitals. And then secondly, I think there's a big education piece to be had. So the first is increasing awareness of the psycho psychosocial impacts of wheelchair prescription to multidisciplinary teams, but importantly, not just to those working in these pediatric clinics, but also to NDIS providers in the community who commonly prescribe this equipment to children, but may not see these conditions often and be aware of these aspects. The second is education to external stakeholders such as equipment suppliers and the NDIA who provide funding in the hope that this can inform their processes to be more child and family centered for, um, for a recommendation that really can be quite emotional and overwhelming for families. And the third is integrating and increasing capacity of social work and psychology support within clinics to ensure emotional, um, sorry, to ensure tailored emotional support and reduce social stigmas that may still be associated with psychological care. And as we heard from parents, that emotional support is really helpful in helping them adjust to illness and um, with their wheelchair acceptance as well. So closing now on some future directions. The first is a randomized control trial with one group receiving the booklet and the other group receiving usual clinical care and assessing the difference in knowledge, quality of life, well-being, and decision-making. There is also a potential for adaptation to culturally and linguistic diverse populations and adaptation to a more child-centered booklet. So I'll just close on um, a parent quote. I think this booklet is great for parents. We had so many emotions and really struggled coming to terms that our child needed a wheelchair. Support for carers is important. I wish I had this booklet when we went through it. So I'd like to acknowledge those who contributed to this research, uh, in particular, my research supervisors and the families who gave of their time to participate as well. Thank you. Thank you, great presentation. Uh, questions? Yeah, you don't get to that easily. <laughs> Just <laughs> go. Thank you, that was really, really interesting. Thank and you. I saw a new future directions about the child-centered booklet and I was just thinking if you could expand on that and are you gonna do separate age groups or how would you do yeah. that? Yeah. Um, so when I was thinking about this, I did do a quick literature search to see if there was anything done similarly for pediatric neuromuscular conditions, um, just to help inform what that could potentially look like for myself as well. Um, and the only one I came uh, across was one that was aimed at, I think, boys around eight to 10 years of age and the disclosure of their diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, and it included, they, they did some interviews as well. So I think to do that, I would need to really get the feedback from kids and what they want because obviously this intervention is for the children but this particular segment is working through parents to get there so I think it could potentially look quite different um, because in my experience the kids are quite ready for it because it gives them freedom it gives them movements so their adjustments in my clinical experience is easier so I wonder if their interest would be more around the design or what can I do or what can I choose um, what can I, what sports can I do? How do I get into avenues that use my chair and my skills and my interests? I feel like that's where that direction may go rather than the prescription process. Yeah, I hope I that answers your I, question. Yes, totally. And yeah. I've just seen a uh, kid's book, like it's a children's book yeah. written for a little boy who had a wheelchair because he had a spinal cord injury. So and it was yeah. really cute. So I thought maybe a children's book. Was More of a story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Thanks, um, Sarah Grace. 
you may not have had enough numbers, but was there any difference in terms of the families and the conditions in terms of the response to the booklet? So I'm just thinking of a child who has Duchenne mm -hmm. muscular dystrophy, they go become non-ambulant later on versus a child with you know type 1 SMA who need early prescription. Were the families in their responses different? Yeah, yeah. All? Great question. Yeah, I didn't have time to go into that. So thanks for asking. Um, we did do some correlations, some statistical correlations to see if there were differences between um, conditions or mobility um, and, and different kind of demographic data. There were no differences when it came to conditions, whether the child um, had started with walking ability or had uh, eventually lost it, etc. The only statistical correlation or significant correlation we saw was the child's age. So those um, kids who are recommended a wheelchair between the ages of zero and two, their parents benefit or they required more time to be guided in terms of emotional support and information about why now. Um, and again, that wasn't condition specific. So that covered all the conditions that participated. It was really more that critical age of zero or two that needed more support. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'd just like to ask you to um, just give all our speakers this afternoon a thank you uh, for their wonderful presentations. And uh, so I'll just do that first. Thank you. It really does show, um, you know, the great research that's going here on, on here at the Randwick Precinct. So thank you. Uh, while we're waiting for the next session to start, uh, if you would like to vote in the People Choice Award, here is the uh, QR code, which you can uh, use and vote. So thank you all uh, for this afternoon's uh, presentations. Thank you.